here at Garfield Memorial. Um, Pastor Chip last week was bragging about his granddaughter helping him lead worship, basically. I, I couldn't see all of it from online, um, and I do want to say hi to my friends online today. Normally, I'm um, chatting with folks and kind of engaging with them. Obviously, I'm engaging with you all in a different way today. Um, but he was bragging about how, you know, she was helping him lead worship, and, she, and he said, ah, Pastor Kurt's got got nothing, can't get anything on me. And um, my son, uh, Malachi, who's in seventh grade, um, played a, uh, a solo piece for the offertory in uh, the heritage service at nine o'clock. And I told him this week, I was like, I mean, I got, I got something at least. So um, it'll be online if anybody, just shameless dad plug, if anybody wants to listen to it. I might post it online later today as well. Um, just because I can. Um, but it, it's, um, it's good to see you all. Pastor Chip, I think, mentioned, um, you know, my part-time, part-time, part-time job is here at the church. My full-time job is that of a financial advisor, um, which I've done for the last a uh, uh, little over 10 years. And so based on that experience, uh, Chip said, hey, I, I think I think Kurt should preach half of this series. So you're going to get me this week, and then next week I'm going to talk a little bit more about abundance. How do we uh, cultivate an abundant mindset within our lives? Um, but I, uh, I, I want to kind of talk today about how do we use money as a weapon or as a tool? And, and, and how do we either use it for good or for harm? So... Before I get into that, we are in the midst of a capital campaign um, that is called Let There Be Light. It's our end-of-the-year offering, and there's, there's three components to it. We're trying to raise for our Christmas offering $200,000 uh, in order to just put us on, on firm uh, financial um, foundation to finish 2024 and then to go into 2025. Um, we're also doing um, a Child of the Light offering that's really being spearheaded by our, um, our, our Heritage Choir. Um, that money, $20,000, is going to go to Laura's home and then to Lutheran Men's Ministry to help um, people that are homeless or at risk. Um, we're going we're gonna to do some things with them. And then we also have the Second Mile Ministries, which you can see has a nice big check mark on it because we've already received the $4,000 that's part of it. There are going to be several opportunities if you want to come and actually put your um, faith into action beyond just giving of dollars. They're going to be preparing meals. So if you'd like to uh, learn more about that, reach out to, uh, to one of us on the staff. We should be able to give you more information there. My family and I, we give to this church because we believe in the mission. And as you saw on the video, um, Jesus in, in Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, your heart is also. And so when we know where our money is going, we know our heart is also going there. So that's one of the reasons I give to this church is because I believe in the mission and the ministry of it. I believe in the good work that's being done uh, for our community and beyond. You know, Pastor Chip took down hundreds of our Love Your Neighbor signs to Springfield, uh, you know, a week or two ago. Like, Garfield Memorial Church is making a difference in our community. We are a force for good. We are widening the circle of God's love. Amen? Amen. And so that, for me, is what motivates my giving. Um, so I hope you'll pray um, and consider giving to that um, offering. In a lot of ways, I think um, the series we're doing right now isn't about getting your money by any means. It's about equipping you um, with financial knowledge because, you know, a good chunk of Scripture talks about finances. And so we want to bless you in that realm and share with you kind of how God's mind thinks in that way. The story we just heard uh, is the story um, of the shrewd manager or the dishonest manager. Um, I like to think of it as the parable of the fired manager, okay? And, and so we engage in this story. We encounter a manager who is getting fired by, a business owner, by the business owner. Now, the scripture calls, him, uh, calls the business owner master, 
For cultural con contextual reasons, I'd like to not use that term, but instead call them, uh, call them the, the, the master a business owner. Are we okay with that? Okay, so, um, so the, ma the manager is getting fired by the business owner, and we don't really know why he's being fired. We don't know if he's incompetent or unethical or, you know, just too shrewd or dishonest. We're not really sure, but I think as we go through this passage, we will see um, some insights into maybe what his behavior was all about that led him to getting fired. Uh, and, and so... As the manager finds out he's going to get fired, the owner says, I need an accounting of all the stuff you've screwed up. I need you to go and do an accounting. So the manager is a white-collar guy. He's got soft hands. And he goes, I'm going to get fired and be unemployed, and I'm going to have to do blue-collar work, and I'm a white-collar guy. And he goes, I can't do that. And so he devises this plan, and his plan is to go to the business owner's customers, the debtors, and strike deals with them, and, and reduce their debt, reduce what they, owe the, the, what they owe the owner in order to curry favor when he's unemployed, that they'll say, hey, you did us a solid, you did us more than a solid, come in and we'll help take care of you. And because there was no unemployment, you know, in that day and age. And, and so when the owner finds out, something strange happens here. Because normal, you know, earthly wisdom would say when, when an owner finds out that the manager who already has done a really lousy job is now basically stealing from him additionally, costing him more money, you would think he would get angry, but instead, the parable flips. And when a parable flips uh, that Jesus is telling, we know to pay attention to it because that's where the spiritual truth is often is. And so the business owner is actually a representation of God in this passage. So God is looking at the manager and saying, huh, well, good, good work. You were really shrewd. You were really uh, you know, cunning and smart to use this opportunity for this, you know, dishonest wealth or, or earthly riches to, to get yourself taken care of. And he likens it to not only, to basically using earthly riches to buy heavenly and eternal favor uh, in, the, in the heart of God. Which doesn't make any sense, does it? So I want to unpack it, but I want to unpack it and in maybe a little bit of a unique way. I wanna, I wanna look and say, was the manager actually using money as a tool or as a weapon? Was he using it for harm or was he using it for good? Because money, we, we learn in the scriptures that the, it's the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money, and so it's how we use money that determines whether it's a vice or a virtue. I want to talk about debt. It's a really exciting topic, I know. But debt appears in the scriptures both as an economic principle and as a spiritual principle. Debt is defined as something, typically money, but in this context of of economic and spiritual, it's really more than just that. But debt is defined typically as money that is owed or due in the exchange of something that was already received. So I owe somebody something. Debt has also been described as spending part of your future. I oftentimes talk to clients and they come to me and we're reviewing their budget and we're looking at their, you know, their assets and their debts, their balance sheet sort of. And one of the things I will sometimes find is that people have credit card debt, but they also have money in the bank. And I'll say, hey, tell me about this credit card debt that you're paying 20% interest on. And, and, and they'll, you know, explain why it's there and I'll say, okay, well, what about this savings that, you know, you've got $3,000 of credit card debt and you've got $4,000 in the bank account? Well, what's the answer they give usually? I'd like to have a little bit of a cushion. 
I gently remind them that they already spent the money in their bank account because they've got this credit card debt over there. And, and so they go, oh, okay, and they usually pay it off because getting out of debt is really important, and we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. But, but debt is described then as spending part of our future. Within our society, we look, um, we really are truly a nation of debt. If you look around, you see debt with treasury bonds and savings bonds and corporate bonds. Debt is a home mortgage. Debt is a car loan. It's student loans. It's a credit card. It's an IOU with a family member. It's a handshake agreement that I'm going to pay you back something you gave me. As a nation, we have a household debt of um, 17.8 trillion, that's trillion with a T, dollars in just household debt, consumer debt, you and me. That's the kind of debt. The average, uh, the total credit card debt is $1.14 trillion, which comes out to an average of about $6,500 of, of credit card debt per household. I will not ask a raise of hands who's above that or below that, but understand that we live in a culture where debt is a normative thing, but when we look at the heart of God, God has a heart that we would live debt-free so that we might only be in debt to God. As a nation, we, um, eight years ago, had a, a national debt of approximately, um, I don't have that written down. The number today uh, is $35.7 trillion. That has gone up $16.87 trillion over the last eight years. To avoid partisanship, because this is a political issue right now. I don't know if you all know there's an election coming up in a couple of weeks. But from six, 2016 to 20, uh, 2020, 2021, the national debt went up $8.78 trillion. And then in the last four years, it's gone up uh, approximately $8.1 trillion. So neither party wins on that one, all right, folks? It's the red and the blue. But how do we approach this as a debt? I'm not providing any solutions today as to how we're going to resolve any of those issues. But I want us to understand that societally and culturally, we, in, we, we internalize those views of debt, even when they come at the, um, at the contrast of what God's heart is. So I want to look at a couple of ways where debt is used as a weapon and causes harm both to the borrower and to the lender. So the first way that debt is used as a weapon is when it becomes a hindrance to the borrower's future. In Luke 16, the, uh, the manager goes to the first debtor and he says, hey, what, how much do you owe? Now, that's a weird question because he should know, and maybe that's one of the reasons he gets fired, but he said, and, and the debtor says, well, I owe 100 uh, gallons of, of olive oil. It doesn't say gallons, containers of olive oil. So I don't know how big a container was. It was probably bigger than a gallon. But I said, well, what is that in today's dollars? How much money would that be? And I said, well, um, if, if, uh, if I shop at Costco and I buy one of those big tubs or those big, I think they're gallons, um, who knows how big they are? Nobody out there. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Good. Nobody can contradict me as being wrong. So one of those big uh, kind of virgin, extra virgin olive oil is like 30 bucks. So if, if I go at the minimum, this guy owes $3,000 to this creditor. Now, we don't know if it's individual debt, if that's for his own business. We're not sure exactly why. But like, that's the cheap olive oil. Y'all know you can buy really expensive olive oil. I'm not a good cook, but I know that that olive oil is really, really expensive. So like, at the minimum, this guy owes $3,000. He could owe $100,000. It's a significant amount of debt. And that, that mindset of debt or that amount of debt becomes a burden in a lot of ways. So then when it's relieved by 20%, by 50%, that is a blessing to that person. As individuals, as I just said, many of us have too much debt in our lives. 
And, and we know what the scripture says in Proverbs 22, 7 to be, um, to be true. And what it says is the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant to the lender. When we find ourselves in too much debt, we've spent too much of our future and it hinders us from living into the future that God is calling us. And so when one of the things I would say is if you do find yourself in debt, begin to think about how can I strategically pay down that debt? I would say this though, if you have credit card debt, that is probably the most important debt to pay off first because the level of interest and the amount that it costs you, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get into all of the nitty gritty of the financial basics. Um, there are plenty of good, good folks out in your lives that can help you with that. If you don't know someone, reach out to one of us at the church. We've got great resources that we can point you in that direction. But remember this, to pay down debt is to buy back your future. And what does God say in, uh, in Jeremiah 29, 11? I have a hope, I have plans for your future, a hope, and I'm butchering it, y'all know it, right? Say it out loud for me, right? Say it louder. I know the plans I have for you. Plans that give you a hope in the future. All right. You can come finish the message if you would like. Um, God wants to call us into a glorious future that is blessed. When we can begin to reduce the amount of debt in our lives, we can free up what our future looks like in God. I know so many people that want to give more generously, but don't feel like they can. And we're gonna talk about how do we move into that next week, but know today one of the very practical re ways to do that is to begin to reduce your debt. I would also say this though, do not feel any condemnation, guilt, or shame if you have debt that is beyond what you, uh, what you can handle. I tell my clients all the time, your self-worth is not your net worth, okay? So please remember that. The second way that, um, am I going the wrong way? <laughs> okay, I'm going the wrong way. What? There we go. I'll tell you about the first service later. It was... It was more of a train wreck than this. So, um, debt as a, a weapon, the second way that debt is a weapon is when the lender exploits the borrower. So, when I come back to this scripture, the manager is reducing the debt pretty significantly. And when the owner doesn't get upset and he says, wow, you were really smart about that, I also wonder, though, if there was more to that story because if you look at um, tax collectors, for instance, in biblical times, tax collectors were hated. They were hated for a very specific reason, though. Not just because they were being used by the empire, the Roman Empire, but also because of the way they collected taxes. So they would go around, and it was typically another Jewish person, but they would go around on behalf of the Roman Empire, and they would say, you owe $50 in taxes, or you owe $100 in taxes. What people didn't necessarily know, although they knew, was what they actually owed the Roman Empire. Because what tax collectors would do is, they owed a certain amount to the empire, but then they would charge the, their fellow Jews a higher amount and they would pocket the difference. So if they didn't know exactly what they owed, kind of like our tax system, where we just kind of get, no, I'm sorry, we'll go off that tangent. But if, if they didn't know, what happens then is the tax collector is basically charging interest, charging extra to line their pockets. So it's very possible that what actually was going, one of the things that might have been going on here is that the manager was saying, hey, we gave you this and then now you owe us this and he's adding on top of that extra to line his own pockets. So the, the, the owner might have been looking at it and this is pure speculation, 
But sometimes we get to do that when there isn't an answer in Scripture. But one of the reasons might be that the, that the, um, the owner says, well, you raised this guy's rate to start with. He really only should have owed me this. And so when you reduced it, yeah, you were smart. You, you used dishonest wealth to curry favor with people. But maybe you were just knocking it down to where it should have been in the first place. You were righting a wrong. And I think this gives us some insight into God's heart is God says, you really better not exploit people. You better not take advantage of them. We just fe- finished a series on James and we skipped over this verse, but I want to read it for you now. If I go, the, yes, I went the right way. In James 5, 4 and 5, it says this. James is writing a letter and he says, listen, listen, listen. The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out. He's saying, hey, business owners, land owners, you've been defrauding your workers. You've been stealing from them, and they've called out to God. And it continues, it says, the cries of the harvested, harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you, the Lord of hosts that's one of the names of God if you go back into the, uh, into the Old Testament. Hosts were heavenly armies. Y'all be in trouble. They didn't just get to God. It got to the Lord of heavenly armies. And then he goes and he says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. God hates when we exploit his children. So beware. Some of you are business owners. It's important that you pay your employees a fair wage, that you don't exploit them. If you're giving loans, don't exploit people. Don't exploit your family members, your friends. Well, there's some scripture about that we're going to get to in just a minute. If I look around our society, this kind of exploitation is legal in many ways. And you might say, well, how? Well, when we use debt as a tool and we charge high interest rates, we're beginning to really rob and steal from people. The subprime mortgage uh, lending crisis was a debt crisis in 2007 that plunged us into recession by 2008. The deepest recession that we had seen since the Great Depression. Many of you lived through that. And debt became an issue in our society. We began to pass rules and regulations where we said, finally, hey, we have to fix this because it's simply just wrong. We didn't necessarily articulate it this way, but I I remember in 2008, I had just started pastoring. And back then, pastors didn't endorse political candidates. I know that's hard to believe for some of you younger folks. But we did stand up for issues. And I remember saying, like, we need to start standing up for some of these issues. In 2008, um, Ohio passed one of the strictest um, payday loan laws in the country. And if you're familiar, we still see payday loans of companies out there today, storefronts, where people will go and get a small advance basically on their paycheck. The problem is they pay exorbitant interest rates. It used to be up to almost 400%. On a, and, and that's, you annualize it, right? So I'm like, oh, we only paid you know, 20%. Well, you pay 20% on a two-week loan. You multiply that by 26, and now you're 400%. So that, that's kind of how the math works. But they would prey on people who didn't understand exactly what that was, or even if they did understand, they didn't have a choice. They had to get borrow the money. And so God says, when you do that, you better watch out. That's one of the ways we can use debt as a weapon. Now, debt also can be used as a tool. One of the ways debt can be used as a tool is when it is incurred with constraints. So 
So the 2008 law that Ohio pa Ohioans passed still had some major loopholes in it um, where the, uh, these payday lenders wouldn't, um, wouldn't actually register under the law, and so they could still charge these exorbitant interest rates. We finally closed that loophole in 2018 because at some level we understood that debt, if we're going to use it as a tool, has to have constraints around it, has to have regulations around it. Uh, I'm going to make a political statement real quick. Those, those politicians out there that want to make us a Christian nation again, they might need to start considering debt as a foundational piece of a godly society. I'll leave that there. Well, no, I won't, because I'm going to read a scripture that speaks to that. So now it's not me. But let's talk about uh, usury. Usury is today defined as um, an illegal action or practice of lending money at an unreasonably high rate. So it's charging way too much interest. That's what usury is. Usury used to be defined as charging interest at all. There used to be an understanding that you didn't charge interest. If you, if you loaned somebody $100, they paid you back $100. They didn't pay you back $120 by the end of the year. Now, we don't live in that society. We've already established that. Could we get back to it? I don't know. But here's what it says in Deuteronomy 23. You shall not charge interest on loans to another Israelite. Interest on money, interest on provisions, interest on anything that is lent. That's pretty clear, right? Now, interestingly, it goes on, and it says, on loans to a foreigner, you may charge interest, but on loans to another Israelite, you may not charge interest, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings in the land that you are about to enter and possess. Basically, what it's saying here is, if you're going to lend to, a, to someone, you better not use it as a means of exploitation. So if you're going to give someone a loan, um, number one, make sure you use good judgment and wisdom, but two, don't take advantage of them. Don't charge them a high interest rate. Don't exploit others. Because when we do, it isn't a tool, but it's a weapon. We can use, um, you can use that when it's loaned responsibly to help people get ahead, Right? Many, many people, one of the American dreams for, for many years has been home ownership. And most people have home ownership, have a mortgage of some kind. Now, interest rates right now are like around 7% in the 80s. I talked to folks and they were, uh, what were they, in the, the teens at that point? Um, but the last 10 to 15 years, like interest rates were 3, 4%. But they enabled many of us to purchase homes, to live in, to build equity, to have a safe place to live, because I couldn't, the, the, if I bought a $200,000 house, I gotta save all that money up and pay cash. That's gonna take me a whole long time to do. And so a mortgage allows us to, <clears throat> to live into our future in hopefully a way that isn't exploitative and that we're able to sustain. So there are ways that debt can be used for good. The second way that debt can be used as a tool is when it is combined with generosity. In Exodus, in Exodus 22, it says, If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not exact interest from them. Again, this interest-free thing, right? And so he's saying, like, hey, if you're going to loan money... To, to, to other people, especially those that kind of are underprivileged or, or have extra needs, like not only don't take advantage of them, but look at it as an opportunity really to bless them. We talk a lot about just giving money away, right? And we call it charity and, and we don't expect anything in return. At least we shouldn't, right? And generosity isn't generosity unless it comes without strings attached. But we can also empower people and maintain their dignity when we give them a loan that they're going to repay. Not everybody in society has a billionaire dad that can fund, you know, give them seed money to start their own businesses. The other thing, though, is that there is no such thing as a self-made man that pulls himself up by his own bootstraps. That's not a thing. 
It's a myth within America. The reality is we raise each other up as a community, and when we use debt as a tool for good, we can use that as a way of raising others up. There's lots of microloan programs that are out there um, across the world, and a lot of them, the way they work is they will give a small amount of money. Um, you see this in, in parts of Africa, you see this in India, where they will give money, especially to the women, to start as seed money for a business. So they'll, they'll get, you know, they'll buy in the, you know, they'll buy the five chickens and then they can, you know, they didn't have money to buy the five chickens, but they buy the five chickens and they build a business from that. They pay their loan back. So they're not indebted to anyone any longer. And they then build their business, right? And that's not just overseas. That can happen right here in the city where we can empower um, you know, minority communities, um, women, like we can give them a leg up, a step up, so that they can then move forward. And we can do that through loans. We can just give the money away. But I know a lot of people that they want to repay that because there's dignity. There's a different type of dignity in that. So potentially consider giving loans that are interest-free. We we'll often say, hey, don't, don't give to friends and family. Um, I have a friend who, when he gives to friends and family, and he gives to friends and family quite a bit, says, I never expect anything back. I give it, and they say, oh, I'm going to give it back. Cool, great, don't worry about it. And he said, you know, oftentimes he doesn't get that money back. But because he doesn't have that expectation that the money is going to get repaid, then he doesn't have the disappointment and the brokenness of a relationship. Because ultimately, debt is not an ex a transaction of just uh, money. It's not just an economic transaction, but it's a transaction of relationship. And so when we can be loaning to each other as a transaction of relationship and trust and helping buy back a future and to buy a future where God is on the throne, where God has a plan for us, a plan, a hope for our future. I still didn't get the verse right. But, but th there's this promise there. We come back to the story of of the um, manager and the owner. I think at the heart of what the manager does is called shrewd because it's an expression of the heart of the business owner. It's an expression of the heart of God. Well, then what is it? It's the forgiving of debt. Because debt can break relationships. It can break futures. It can break us as individuals, not just economically and financially, but spiritually and relationally. And so when we forgive debt, we're releasing that control and that manipulation and that, and that pain and that hurt, that separation that happens. And that's the heart of God. In Leviticus um, 25, Verse 10, it says, And you shall hollow the 50th year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return, every one of you, to your, to your property, and every one of you to your family. The year of jubilee was laid out in the Old Testament. Since it was written, six thousand plus years ago it has never been practiced god's heart is to celebrate and have a year of jubilee a year of forgiveness of wiping clean the slate you may have been in an indebted servant for 49 years and there may be no promise no hope of getting out of that except the grace and the love of God that says it is time to wipe out those debts, to wipe out those sins, for you are free to serve God 
and to not serve money. Because the passage ends when it says you cannot serve God and money together. You have to serve one or the other. The way that we do that is through Jubilee, which is an act of forgiveness. It's an act of forgiving debts, of restoring relationships, of freeing the captives, of proclaiming and reclaiming a future with hope. Amen? Y'all are sleepy today. I need some help. And so that is where God's heart is at, is to have a spiritual jubilee in your lives. And that spiritual jubilee might get initiated by an economic jubilee, a financial jubilee. You can create your own jubilee by paying down your debt. You can create a jubilee by loaning interest-free to a friend, a family member, to someone who is underprivileged. So I leave you with this question today. How are you going to create a jubilee in your life so that God can move you into a future with hope and promise 